We're back. Season five of the Big Bid Theory, powered by Bid Prime, is off and running. This is Bill Colhane, the host of your show, returned from the break, sitting here in our newly, and I mean very newly, refurbished studio. As a matter of fact, I can still see a couple of the construction guys walking around. Yes, Austin is currently hosting the wildly popular South by Southwest. And, and speaking of not underway, South by has helped ensure downtown gridlock. Gridlock has visited our fair city. I remember, and I've been around Austin long enough, I remember when South by was just a little gathering of a handful of people. And now it's absolutely, as you know, absolutely exploded. The Rick Jennings is looking at me. He's behind the glass. Rick makes all all of the magic happen here on the Big Bid Theory. Before we really get rolling, by the way, a quick plug, a heads up that our very own Kevin Henderson stayed busy in the offseason while I was fortunate, Rick was fortunate, we were traveling east, west, north, and in my case, a little bit south as well. Well, what Kevin did is he's redone TBBT's logo. And he also put together a new and improved media kit for our little show. As a matter of fact, if you want to check it out, you can head over to bitprime.com. Go to the podcast page and you'll find a link to Kevin's work of absolute excellence. It's down there towards the the bottom of the page uh, for the show. And by the way, there as well, you can go back and listen to uh, prior episodes as well if you want to do that. I'll make you a promise. In season five, we're going to continue to reach out to, invite, and bring on nothing but absolutely superb guests. I don't know what we had in mind when we originally started the show, but we continue to be beyond thrilled about our our track record in regards to the guests we bring on. And also, and this is important, a crazy bitch you can win lives on, as you're going to hear a little bit later in this episode. Okay, let's roll up our sleeves. Let's put on our our serious hats for a moment. As our longtime listeners understand, there are a number of topics in particular that really move our needle. That's our podcast is no different than other any other podcast, any other show out there. I guess when it comes to that, but a couple of examples. Last season on the show, we talked about the threat of wildfires in the U.S., what should be done. Had Dr. Keeley from UCLA on, had Dr. Wilkin as well from the University of California. Disaster preparedness, that, that was another topic where we respectfully suggest that there's room for improvement. We talked about that. Right there alongside is the lingering infrastructure deficit in the U.S. If you do things like, oh, I don't know, drive, ride flying planes or or use water, you may want to stick around and listen to the rest of this episode. If you have a really good memory, you'll recall that we started season four by having a conversation with our friend Barry LaPatner, author of Too Big to Fall, America's Failing Infrastructure and the Way Forward. Well, here we are 12 months or so later, and to find out the latest, and the production team decided an excellent way, an excellent way to kick off season five, we invited onto the show Brian Palish, the Managing Director of Government Relations and Infrastructure Initiatives from ASCE. As many of you know, that's the American Society of Civil Engineers. And by the way, uh, don't want to proceed don't want to proceed any any farther without thanking Alexa Lopez from ASCE. She helped the logistics, helped us to coordinate Brian's visit. Brian, who can be found on Twitter, incidentally, at B Palish. That's B P A L L A S C H. He joined ASCE back in '99, so clearly he's been immersed in the topic of infrastructure for quite some time. He's a proud USC Trojan, as he pointed out to me. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in Journalism and International Affairs from USC and a Master's in International Affairs from the American University. Although faced with an incredibly, and we'll talk about it more in our upcoming conversation, but a real busy schedule right now for Brian and the folks at ASCE. But Brian still took some time to visit the show, and we're, we're grateful for that. And here's my conversation with him. Brian Pallas joins us on the Big Bid Theory Hotline. And, and Brian, it really wasn't that long ago where we all heard about Trump's massive, in all caps, massive infrastructure bill. And we've all heard, we understand there is in the neighborhood of a $2 trillion infrastructure investment gap. When I spoke with Alexa, she mentioned to me that ASCE this week have over 270 people from across the country coming to D.C. to, to meet with Congress 
and discuss infrastructure investment. But first of all, Brian, what would you say to those people out there who ask, what's the big deal about infrastructure? Why are we even talking about it? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think, uh, you know, infrastructure is something we don't see or think about unless it's um, a hindrance to us, if that makes sense, right? So we all go about our day and you turn on the tap and you get a nice glass of clean water that you can drink and you can flush the toilet and the water leaves your house. But when those things don't work, that's when you start to think about, huh, wait a minute, uh, we got an infrastructure problem. We estimate there's about 240,000 water main breaks every year in the country. So there'll be a couple of them while we're doing this conversation today. That's just one piece of the infrastructure. Most people probably drive to work. Depending on where you live, you might be stuck in traffic. You were talking earlier about the traffic in Austin this week with uh, the events going on there with South by Southwest. That's a unique situation where that's just maybe once a year where you get that level of traffic. But there are places in this country where people are wasting the better part of two work weeks a year in traffic. So upwards of 80 hours a, a year that they are wasting stuck in traffic. Um, and then there's just the condition of our road system. I know in the Washington area, we get a little bit of freeze and thaw. And what that ends up doing is causing potholes. I don't exactly drive a straight line to work at this time of year anymore. I'm kind of weaving. And it's, it's uh, mainly because I'm trying to avoid the giant potholes that are on the various roadway systems in this area. So I don't pop a tire or bend a rim or worse, uh, break an axle. Uh, uh, on my vehicle. So we've been able to, using some, uh, using an economic consulting firm, uh, figure out what the poor infrastructure costs American families. Uh, and that number is relatively significant. It's $3,400 a year in the, in, if you will, in the cost of that, that infrastructure that's not performing the way it should, if that makes sense. So what that means is it's the potholes that I talked about. It's a water main break that might flood your basement or close your business, but it's also the cost of moving goods around the country. And that cost of goods movement as congestion gets worse, as the roadway system gets worse, as inland waterways back up and things like that, the cost of moving our goods around, making sure that our stores have have goods in them, making sure our, our agriculture products can get to market, if that costs more, those, those costs just get passed on to consumers, which is part of that $3,400 a year. A couple points of clarification there, Brian. First of all, South by Southwest is going on in Austin right now, but Austin traffic 24-7, 365, it doesn't matter if South by Southwest is going on or not. There's a, there's a river that runs through town, so essentially it's bridges if you want to go north, south. And speaking of bridges, we did a report on, and it was in, in large part based on the findings from ASCE, but uh, we reported on the deficient bridges. Here, here throughout the, the country as well. And so, um, so certainly there are many areas that have to be addressed when it comes to infrastructure. And as I know you know, Brian, many members of Congress ran on platforms. We were witness to the campaign promises, in part calling for addressing the infrastructure. So you're there boots on the ground. What kind of response is ASC getting from Capitol Hill? And I would argue as important as that from the state and local governments as well. What, I guess what I'm asking is, what are the chances for bipartisan support in the coming months over the next year? Well, I mean, I think, and I think one of the questions you asked at the beginning is how how the president's plan is going. And I would say President Trump's plan for infrastructure is evolving, uh, which it needed to do. And and what we're seeing now with the new uh, new majority, the new Democrat majority in in the House, is that we're seeing a little bit more of an emphasis on infrastructure. We've actually been uh, lucky. We've been called to testify in front of Congress. This this week uh, will be the third time in three weeks that we've testified in different committees about infrastructure and, and the need to invest. Last week, it was the first time in five years that the House Ways and Means Committee held a hearing on infrastructure. And some might ask, well, why does the Ways and Means 
committee care about infrastructure? Well, they're the ones that can actually find money in the, the tax system and, and elsewhere to actually find a way to pay for some of our infrastructure. And that's terribly important. I mean, ASCE has always taken the approach that we should we should improve our infrastructure, but we should also in many ways pay as we go, meaning we should find the money to, to pay for these improvements and let users pay for those improvements. Um, so the Ways and Means Committee had a four-hour hearing last week to talk about ways in which we can find some resources to pay for infrastructure, some of the solutions that need to be out there. This week, we have a, a, we're testifying in the Transportation Appropriations Committee about how we can make infrastructure more resilient so that when we have storm events, weather events, other type of, of, of incidents with our infrastructure, that the infrastructure can be built better and safer uh, so that it can it bounce back from those types of events more frequently or more in, in a faster fashion, in a more uh, robust fashion. So um, I think there's a lot of interest in the Congress. From what I'm witnessing, and, and at least in terms of the hearings, everyone seems to be talking in a more bipartisan fashion about solving some of these problems. You know, at some point, they're going to have to put paper to uh, pen to paper and, and try and solve some of this stuff. But we're hopeful that this year, in an effort to be bipartisan, that we can actually get the president and both the House and Senate to move forward on some significant legislation that would address the, the problems that we're facing. And you mentioned earlier the $2 trillion in infrastructure investment needed. I think that's, you know, I don't know that the Congress will come up with all $2 trillion, but uh, coming up with a good chunk of it, um, I you know, my my hope would be close to 50 percent would be a, would be the beginning of of really turning it around. And you know, from our parlance, we grade the infrastructure on an A through F scale. Right now, we're at a D plus. If we can get Congress to spend a little bit of money and, and focus their effort, um, hopefully by 2021, the next time we release our report card, that grade can go up. That's always been our goal. That's our focus. And then when we look at states, I'll segue to that real quick. States really are taking the lead and have been taking the lead for some time. The federal government needs to be a better partner, and we say that, but uh, states are, are acting on their own. 27 states in the last five years have made significant investments in some form or another. Frequently, it's raising their, their state gas taxes, but they, there's other ways they can do those things as well, but primarily their state gas taxes to actually fund transportation infrastructure investment. And then other localities, in addition, have been doing things in the area of water and parks and other things like that. But we're seeing a lot of movement. We have Currently, we're seeing bills in a number of states, Alabama and Arkansas and Ohio, uh, Hawaii, are all talking about raising their, their gas taxes to pay for improvements to their, their much-needed uh, road and, and bridge uh, systems, their, the, the improvements that are needed there. So we're actually seeing a lot of progress. And I will say, from what we see, the American people want to see that. In a recent poll, I think it was at sort of the beginning of the Congress, 79 percent of Americans said it's extremely important to increase spending on infrastructure. It's hard to get Americans to agree on 79 percent of anything, right? So uh, sure. So the fact that we could get them to 79 percent on infrastructure is, is, is uh, I think, very positive and, and a step in the right direction. I think there's no doubt about that. And that's the feedback we get when we travel out and about as well. A couple of years ago on this show, Greg DiLoretto, and you mentioned the testimony before the Ways and Means Committee. I, I believe Greg was involved in that, um, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, Correct. He was, our, Greg, he was our witness. He was. So I, I got that intel correct. Well, for the listeners who didn't hear the episode a couple of years ago, Greg from ASCE two years ago talked about, and I'm going to quote him here, we have a 20th century infrastructure we're paying for with 20th century revenue sources as we live in the 21st century. But we have many listeners out in California, uh, your home state, Brian, and not too long ago, as you know, the Golden State was a battleground. Why was defeating California's Prop 6, which would have repealed an increase in California's gas tax, why was that important? And how could, and I, I, I hear you say gas tax, but, but how else can we in the U.S. fund infrastructure? So there's 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 a number of different ways. I mean, I think the California situation, the California ballot initiative, was terribly important in the sense that it was one. California, it was, it was 
it was the it was the most important thing we were focused on uh, during the fall. How's that? So uh, I spent a couple of weeks in California trying to help our members better understand it and try and educate some folks out there. So uh, and and frankly, as you you noted, I grew up there. Um, traffic is bad there. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's it's worse than when I grew up there, and 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 they're doing as much as they can to address it. But you know, as I in in not only is the the traffic bad, the roads are not in great condition as well. So it's it's a combination. It's that combination effect. But I think fr- from the, from the broader perspective on on how we can address these needs. Yes, there is a gas tax right now. That's probably the best method for collecting revenue that's related to how much you use the roads. You know, we like to sort of connect that user to the to the infrastructure that they're using. Sure. And, and so that is a way to do it. Um, you know, we pay water rates. Those water rates actually fund some of the infrastructure improvements, right? So you, if you're if you're paying for your water, which everyone does pay for their water, um, you're paying for that. Um, as we look more towards transportation, I think what you're going to see, and I know California did this as part of their their what they call SB1, which is the piece of legislation that Prop 6 was trying to repeal. They actually instituted um, additional fees on vehicle registration, not only for regular uh, regular gas powered vehicles. But they instituted special fees for electric vehicles because if you have an electric vehicle, you obviously aren't paying a gas tax anymore. And while that's good for the environment, and California is making significant strides to clean their air and to to uh, go towards zero carbon emissions, people are also still driving. And so uh, sure. the the fact that you're taking up space, if you will, on the roadway needs to somehow be accounted for. So I think what you're going to see in some states is a fee on electric vehicles vehicles. The other thing that's being piloted in a number of states around the country is something called a mileage-based user fee. So currently, the gas tax sort of is a mileage-based user fee because you pay right now, at least at the federal level, and state gas taxes are all over the place, but at the federal level, you pay 18.4 cents a gallon for for the federal tax. That's sort of a mileage-based user fee, except we all get different amounts of mileage uh, per, per how we're using our vehicle, right? So it is a slightly different. This would actually be a flat fee, uh, a, a, a probably cents per mile on, on how much you're driving. Oregon has piloted the program. California's got a pilot going on. And there are a number of other states that, that are also taking a look at it. But trying to figure out a way to, without breaching privacy, uh, collect people's mileage, and then charge them uh, a fee for for driving directly on the roads. So that's sort of the future, but that future is a little bit far off. It's more like 15 or 20 years off than, than right around the corner. We'll keep our eye on that, and I can confirm, I can provide expert testimony. I was out in L.A. and San Diego back in July, and you are correct about the traffic traffic issues out there. Uh, amazing how people uh, how people try to get around. Now, last thing, Brian, and then I'll, we'll let you go. Again, we understand it's a busy, busy week for ASCE. I know the Water Resources Development Act is particularly important to you, but if you could put together a list of priorities, what are the most pressing needs right now, March of 2019, if you had to food chain it? Two or, or three things that have to be taken care of today. I'm going to answer it this way, and there's there's lots of different ways to answer it. But um, rather than pick a particular category, I, I I think one of the ways we're trying to look at this is is resources that are spent at the federal level, state level, local level, by any level of government or the private sector, uh, when we're when we're focused on infrastructure, need to really be focused on on sort of two areas. The first is public health and safety. So much of our infrastructure is the purpose of it is or or it has a connection to you and I being safe. So think about the roadway system. If there are bad potholes or a deficient bridge that restricts traffic or if there's water systems that, that provide clean water to folks and they are compromised, if there's a wastewater treatment plant that's compromised and therefore sewage is being dumped into a river, you talked about the rivers there in Austin. Um, I think our, our real focus is that whole public health and safety component. So there's a way within in all of those categories of infrastructure that I talked about, that you can triage, if you will, and pick those 
projects that are most important to improve public health and safety. And then the other piece is we also need to look at this from an economic standpoint. We know, and the Trucking Association put out a report about a month ago, I think, that talks about the top 100, I think is what it was, freight bottlenecks in this country. Well, those freight bottlenecks contribute directly to that $3,400 a year I was talking about. And if we can clean up some of those freight bottlenecks, and there's other bottlenecks within our infrastructure system, but they just happen to come up with those, um, we can start addressing some of of the longer-term problems that we have. If we look at legislation, so I'll flip it over to, to probably the better way you wanted me to answer the question. If you think about it in terms of legislation, the probably the most pressing thing we need to address right this minute is addressing this, this problem that we have with the Federal Highway Trust Fund, that federal gas tax. There's going to be, at the end of 2020, a $15 billion gap or hole in that trust fund per year. So Congress really needs to get about the the, pro- the problem of fixing that highway trust fund. That's, that's number one. And then number two, you know, the president released his budget today. I will admit to you freely that I have not gone through all of the, of the president's budget. The early returns on infrastructure are that it doesn't it, there are some cuts to the infrastructure funding in that budget. Those are the headlines, if you will. And our concern would be that we need to ensure that that the federal government is a better partner in infrastructure investment and making sure that they are funding programs that are already authorized. You mentioned the Water Resources Development Act, WERDA. Um, we've been able to be very successful with that in three consecutive Congresses and get three consecutive bills passed over six years. That hasn't happened in a long time. But we now have to fund the programs that we've authorized. We authorized a levy safety program. That's been pretty much underfunded. We've authorized a dam safety program and a high hazard dam rehabilitation program. Both of those have been underfunded. They've been funded, but they've been underfunded, not to the not to the amount that Congress would like them to be funded. So we've got some of those types of programs that if we just fund them, not only will we improve our infrastructure, but we'll get better grades. The National Park Service has a twelve billion dollar maintenance backlog in our national park system. Part of that, about half of that is the road system. So it's when you and I go and visit those national parks. And the other half is simply the facilities in them, the bathrooms, the visitor centers, and all of that stuff. That's We should be able to fix those problems. We should be able to find money in the federal budget to, to, to chip away at that stuff. Um, and so we see those two things as working together. We need to fix that trust fund um, and address those issues and then properly fund already already authorized programs within the federal government. In summary, a lot going on currently, and as you've established and we've talked about on the show for years now, still a lot more that needs to be done. All the best to you and the fine folks at ASCE. Again, I know it's a busy, it's an important week for ASCE, it so is. all the best to you, and, and thanks again thanks. for joining the show. And, and I just say, hey, folks should go to infrastructurereportcard.org, uh, and they can go learn more about this. And if they want to chime in and talk to their legislators at any level of government, we'll, we're glad to help them do that. Very good. And on that note, Kevin or Rick will put a link to uh, that reference in the description Perfect. of the, the show as well. So, Brian, again, Great. thanks. Uh, best of luck, and uh, be safe driving out there. Thanks. Same to you. Yet again, thank you, Brian. Go As Brian pointed out, go to infrastructurereportcard.org and see how your state's doing. You may be happy, possibly sad, or, and this is important, uh, you may be moved to find out what the heck's going on. There's a mother load of excellent and eye-popping info contained in the report. I've looked it over a number of times over the past few years since I visited with Greg, in particular, since I visited with Greg DiLoretto a couple of seasons ago. Kevin is going to include, as I mentioned, Kevin will include a a link to the report in the podcast description. How often do people use pens anymore? (laughs) Also, ASCE's website is ASCE.org. That's pretty convenient. Or on the Twitterverse, they go by ASCE Gov, G-O-V-R-E-L. So you want to follow them on on Twitter. There's, There's no doubt about that. Okay, changing gears in a big way as we move to the first edition of Crazy Bids You Can Win here in Season 5. I take a glance, we took a glance 
through the bidprime.com database. Do you enjoy a nice glass of vino from time to time? You have a nice steak or piece of chicken and you had a glass of wine to the meal. The port of Kennewick, Washington sits in the Columbia River. It's it's east of Portland. I don't know the geography that well, but I think it's a couple of hours east of Portland. Speaking of cities I've visited in the past few months, and it's also southwest of Spokane, guesstimation two or three hours. Spokane, a city we most recently visited a few years ago. But anyway, is this a crazy bid or what we consider a very interesting bid? I'll let you decide. The Port of Kennewick has a number of instances of solicitations involving the construction of a wine-tasting building. Kennewick likes their wine. As a matter of fact, they already received the 2017 Governor's Smart Communities Smart Partnerships Award for construction of the Columbia Gardens Urban Wine and Artisan Village. Now, a gorgeous wine-tasting building is on the horizon. Join me in raising a glass to those folks. Okay, sorry about that. Season 5 is here. Stay tuned. We're going to continue to look near and far for topics and guests that will help to keep you in the know. We're so grateful to you and your efforts in helping us by, by sharing, downloading, and following the Big Bit Theory. For compliments, complaints, or you just want to stop by and say howdy, as we say in Texas, you can email me at bcolhane at bidprime.com. We're back rolling on Twitter. Going to really get geared up in the Twitterverse. You can follow us at the Big Bid Theory. My Twitter handle is contract underscore hunter. And as you most of you know, we're also on Facebook as well. Powered by Bid Prime on behalf of our TBBT team. Incredibly excited about what's to come in Season 5. Thanks again to Brian Palish and Alexa Lopez from ASCE. Infrastructure, it's important to me, to you, and yes, to you and you also. Thank you, Rick Jennings. Rick, give everyone a wave. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. This is Bill Colhane. Until next time, go Gunners, Barracudas, Tigers, Bobcats, and Cubs. And we wish you all the best in growing your business. Powered by Bid Prime, we thank you for tuning in to The Big Bid Theory. From Austin, Texas, the show is produced by Bill Colhane and Jim Ward. Producer and engineer is Rick Jennings. Distribution research and production assistance by Lauren Jones and Kevin Henderson. You can find other episodes of The Big Bid Theory on platforms to include iHeart, iTunes, Spreaker, and Google Play. So much fun.